foundational statements and learning principles are critical to guiding decisions, strategies, and communication, especially during a crisis. Very, very um, honored and excited to have with us today, Barry Dequan, who's the director of the International School of Zug and Luzerne, which for those of you who don't know your geography too well, is in where? Switzerland. And Barry has more than 25 years of experience in international leadership and teaching in international schools, including in Swaziland, in um, the Lincoln School in Buenos Aires, American School in Sao Paulo, which has many names, graded, Escola Graduada, many different names, and the American School of Brasilia. When he's working with us, the PTC, he teaches our Creating an Effective School course. Barry, over to you. Unmute. Thank you, Bambi. And thank you for coordinating this, and thanks to Zach and Sky for making this happen, all the logistics. Honored to be here with everyone today. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a bit about um, our school's journey in the context of a key focus area in the PTC, that of uh, foundational statements and learning principles. Uh, before doing that, though, I, I'd like to frame this around some words that I shared with our graduating class this year at their ceremony. Um, and I said something to the effect as this. If someone had stated earlier this semester that campuses around the world would be closed from one day to the next, that over one billion students would spend the coming months learning from home and connecting with teachers online, the person would have been laughed out of the room. But this is exactly what happened. It was remarkable to see how quickly our communities adapted. It was affirming to witness what can be accomplished when real or perceived barriers are removed. And I think back to Pip Curtis's uh, Pearl when she was quoting John Cotter's change process and that sense of urgency. I couldn't have imagined a, a greater sense of urgency there. So at the time, I frequently heard the refrain that nothing could have prepared us for living, working, and leading through the pandemic. And I respectfully disagree with that statement. All of our life experiences have prepared us for these very moments. Our life journeys will include the need to face adversities, when our character and values are tested, when we are transformed for the better. We know that real growth comes from overcoming setbacks and challenges. We tend to learn much more from failures than our successes. We have all had to overcome personal crucibles, learn from those experiences, and then emerge transformed and changed in a fundamental way. And can it be that the formidable challenges in our lives happen for us and not to us? Mm. The pandemic has indeed challenged us in ways we could not have previously imagined, and it has not always been easy. But I do believe that our life experiences, the crucibles we have overcome, have prepared us for the challenges we face this year and will face uh, going into next year. Our families and teachers and staff have all inspired and emboldened us, and our students have been heroic throughout this journey, showing us how to flourish with grace, class, and good humor during a time of uncertainty and change. So I share all of that in part because of the story I'm about to tell, but also the, the idea of a disposition that we hold as principals, as leaders, as educators, that sense of eternal optimism that we have an obligation to exhibit for our students. And there are opportunities for growth if we step into this. So I'm going to share my screen here. And my pearl to that end is, Foundational statements and learning principles are critical to guiding decisions, strategies, and communication, especially during a crisis. So I'm not going to share much that you don't already know, but I will frame it in the context of our personal circumstance. And the caveat to all of this is, and I say this with the greatest levels of humility and awe and caution, uh, this is our story. Uh, it wasn't perfect. Uh, we've learned a lot from it. There were some great moments of success. We're not done yet either. We know that there's some challenges coming ahead. Uh, but for me, this is a process. And how did we manage this? So here's the story. And I find it a bit helpful to talk uh, about theory in, in the context of an example. And I'll come back to this statement I shared with the seniors, which I thought was extremely powerful. How we see things. Things can happen for us rather than to us. And 
put aside the, the, the tragic circumstances that some of the, the people in the world are facing right now, for schools that are able to go forward, uh, there is an opportunity for us to step into this situation and to learn from it and to grow and better serve our, our communities. But through that, how did we make decisions? And all of you know this, you're hearing voices from all sides saying, you need to do this, that's wrong, I'm upset, this is my personal circumstance, that's the right decision. And if you're not grounded with some foundational statements or visions or purpose, then it's easy to get lost in that process. So when our team came together and we brought together a, a COVID, I won't call it a crisis team, but a, just a team of very thoughtful, um, knowledgeable people from communications to our medical nursing staff to our leadership team. And we just started unpacking our mission. And what were some of the statements from our mission statement? Again, this is a mission statement that represents us well. So we're, to, we're a community of learners. So we knew we were going to learn through this process. And that was key. We made that public over and over again. We we're determined to make the world or our corner of it in Zug a better, kinder place. And that kindness was key to this whole process. We'll jump to our vision. Now we had a real commitment to helping students achieve more than they thought they could achieve more than they thought possible. And that was difficult, but we also realized that when we closed campuses and students went home, that there are other opportunities. And we did see many students thrive during that time. And that was a good question for us that we're still continuing to explore is why did those students thrive while others didn't, which may not have been the same case while they're on campus. And then Colleen Broderick, our deputy director, um, she created this template for us um, which is really helpful for us to think about um, the purpose of each of those foundational documents. I'm not talking about learning principles yet, which I will. And the professional learning framework, which I won't get into today. Um, but basically, the, the learning fr framework for us as professionals. The mission, vision, values, what questions are we answering? How do we use it? Uh, what, does it what does it inform and who through that process? So this was critical for us when we kept talking about the mission to our community and they kept bringing it back to us um, about making the world a better place, enthusiastic inquiry, uh, things like that. But then we took it a step further because we had to make a lot of decisions under very stressful, difficult circumstances like all of you have and will continue to do so probably. Uh, we did reopen our campuses just so you know. Um, by the end we had on this campus about a thousand students and teachers and adults uh, fully engaged back in the learning process. And at the high school campus, we had uh, kind of a rotating cycle, a bit more complicated there, but we had the grade levels coming in. So it was a really powerful experience for us to see those different stages and how we returned. And these guiding principles that got us there was about health and wellness and safety are the priority. And we kept talking about that to when we made a decision. The feedback from parents was, even though they may not have agreed with the decision, they appreciated the logic behind it, the rationale, the thoughtfulness, and they were guided by a set of, a set of principles. We had a continuity of learning plan, and that served us while the campus was closed. But we also said while we're reopening, we knew it was working, so we didn't want to stray from that. That was giving people a sense of security, there was continuity, uh, teachers were already adapting to it, students were adapting to it. So we said, let's not disrupt that. But as we're coming back, we're not shifting everything to school right away, it's at home. And that was by design just to make that transition smooth, reduce the number of variables. We knew we had to be flexible and adaptable. And number four was key, we gave families a choice. And we talk about that idea of kindness or trying to differentiate the need to the needs of our, our staff and our, and our families. So they had a choice whether they want to send their children back or not for whatever compelling reasons they may have had as, as a family. And then with all of that, we pulled out three focus areas, health, wellness, and learning. And then there were three groups, students, staff, and parents. And, and Colleen brought up this idea of the, the equalizer. Um, we had to tweak things here and there depending on what stage we were in closing, adapting to closure, reopening, who needed more support. For example, 
through one of the, the feedback processes, some of our parents wrote back and just talked about the emotional, physical toll that this was having on them at home, having to work their full-time jobs while supporting the learning of their children. Yeah. We just thought a lot about the wellness and parents and if there was anything we could have done to support them. And so all of these nine areas kept there. We wanted them at the highest level possible, but you can only focus so much at one time. So we kept tweaking here and there and shifting as we learned. And it was definitely a learning process. We kept asking for feedback from students, from staff, from parents, and learning as we went. And it, was, it was an incredible process for our own growth and to understand that home environment which I see as a great opportunity now for us as we go forward. One of our teachers, our music teacher, talked about doing uh, uh, music classes where uh, they were using a recorder. And she said, I think it was 24, 25 parents bought a recorder and was taking the class online with the kids. She said it was brought her to tears with such an emotional uh, reaction, that, that involvement in learning. I'll skip through these fairly quickly. Uh, the then we came to our learning principles. And as we continue to tweak our continuity of learning program, our at-home learning program, we wanted to make sure that we're continuing to center on the learner. And our, and our teachers were absolute heroes in this process. Learning as they went, trying to manage their home situation, as all of you have done in your own communities. So centered on the learner, the emotional piece. I, I think if there's anything that uh, rose to the surface as time passed. I think I saw a graph somewhere of at the beginning of the closure, there was a high need for structure organization. There was less of a need of connection and emotional. And as time passed, that, that those curves reversed, where there was less of a focus on structure and more on the emotional need for everyone involved. You know, assessments, how do we give feedback? And that was something that I know all of you have experienced giving feedback in a real-time setting is much more efficient than having to do it online with many students are writing it down and with staff and with our colleagues which is easy to strain some relationships it was really important that we communicated often and frequently and making learning meaningful that didn't stop there were cooking classes students making their own instruments here uh, something that was relevant to them and then connected and this piece about connecting uh, <clears throat> and Bambi I know uh, you always talk about the learning principles being, uh, they're, they're not up for debate, it's cognitive science. And so I agree with you. And we, we changed some of the language here for our own context. This one maybe is a bit of an outlier that we just talked about the importance of uh, the social interactions. Our teachers were, and principals were fantastic in preparing for the return of students to campus. What they did, what we did was build in a lot of social time in the first few days where students were outside just connecting. And I've never seen such joy. After being away from each other, it, you, we should never underestimate the power of connection, the social development, kids just being outside and just being kids. It was remarkable. And staff was the same thing. We are in a human endeavor here at schools. And the more we can connect, the better. And then this last bit about uh, throughout this, I kept telling parents, we need to be exceedingly human as we go through this process. And some quick reflections and learning. Um, outreach phone calls. Again, these weren't our ideas. We got them from everyone else. We made phone calls uh, with our staff that were less engaged, i.e. They, they weren't able to bring their work home. And then we called uh, all the parents in the school just to check in, how are you doing? Community Zoom calls. We've had uh, almost 400 uh, uh, parents uh, on these calls. It was fantastic just to connect with them. The feedback from parents is they appreciate our vulnerability in our communication. And we told them that we didn't know, but this is how we're going to work through a solution. And then flexible and supporting families. Some families had gone through the SARS experience. Some families have been overseas for the first time. Everyone had a different experience and for us to adapt to each of them. And then finally, it was just difficult for everyone involved, as you know. And so we just tried to make that a priority and be empathetic even when people were upset and complained that we had to understand that there was something behind that. And with that, I'll explain this photo. Uh, and myself at home, my wife was working and her office even closed. So it was myself and our two and a half, myself and my two and a half year old daughter. And uh, I was looking at my phone in the evening and there was this photo and I realized, huh, I was focused so much. I didn't even see her playing with the phone and she learned how to take a photo. 
And then I was scrolling through my WhatsApp messages and I realized she had sent this photo to the board president of the school. And I said, okay, she's developed a lot of her own skills. And I had to write an embarrassing message to my board president who laughed. Uh, but it just reminded me of the challenges that we all faced at home with our kids and just trying to spend time with them. And uh, I just learned a lot myself in that process and realized my own limitations. Anyway, anyway, because of time, I'll skip this one. But I'll end on that. Um, foundational statements and principles, I think just absolutely critical to guiding our decisions and strategies and communication. Thank you, Barry. Can you uh, unshare so we can see you large on the screen? There you go. Great, thank you. Okay. So just one, uh, one question uh, that's coming through. Um, the role of the, uh, the principal specifically in, you, you shared with us a bunch of tools and things that, that were useful that are drawn from the foundational documents. If those don't exist, you know those tools are not going to obviously be in place. So what would, would, how would you maybe talk a little bit about the role of the principal? You're a head of school now. Um, what, is there a difference? Should there be a particular role that a school principal is playing that's different? Is it just being a member of a leadership team? If you could talk a little bit about that. You know, for the principals, they, uh, of course they have their, their own divisions. Every division is a bit different uh, based on their needs and so the for example, the, the early years, uh, children versus the high school, at-home learning programs looked quite different. And so though we had some guiding principles at school, the principals would take those and then redefine what those would look like in their own divisions. That was part of that. Second was just checking in. How did they adjust from walking into a hallway, a classroom, and quickly getting the sense of the energy of a school or, or a learning space and moving that to an online environment was really difficult. And I, I think part of their learning was uh, how do we interact with our teachers and the learning environments through a virtual platform. And so that was one of our challenges and I think they did a great job. Um, and then just the feedback and the conversations, I think a lot of the, what happens in the school, uh, it's just so much easier to do it face to face. And so for the principals, uh, their role was really to manage those divisions, uh, and differentiate based on those needs, and just connect with their teams uh, and, and parents and children on a regular basis. So uh, along those lines, if you were looking for a new principal at your school, based on knowing that it, you know, it's possible that this is not necessarily always going to be school as we know it, would you be looking for different qualities, different skills, school, uh, skills that are more emphasized now that you've been through this experience and if you were to hire a new principal? Um, it's a good question. I, I think one of the, the skills that was needed throughout this, let me put my pearl on before I forget, but uh, one of the skills that was needed throughout this process was uh, to live with a bit of amb ambiguity and uncertainty and be able to adapt quickly and to make some decisions. Uh, again, was, we had a set of guiding principles that were transferred uh, to more specific language by division. And so for people to be mission-driven, purpose-driven, that for me is critical. Two, the adaptability and flexibility to see things a new way. Three, to kind of let go a bit. Uh, I think when you're physically on campus, it's a bit easier to uh, be engaged and monitor. When you go online, uh, the comments I heard from the principals regularly was, I feel like I don't know what's going on. And that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That, we have a tremendous team here and they trusted them as professionals. Um, but I, if I can go back in time, I think what we might have done a bit more is check in more regularly. So I, I think the, the skill set for a principal is someone that is empathetic, uh, supporting the teachers, supporting the students. Um, uh, I, I don't know if those skills are any different than what we'd want in a regular school environment anyway. Uh, as, as education continues to evolve and look a bit different in the future, I think what's one of our, our um, requirements uh, in terms of our dispositions to be open-minded, be adaptable, think about the human side, be exceeding the human in the process, um, and just focus on the learning. How can we best support our kids at the end of the day, whatever environment that looks like? Yeah, and that can look obviously very different, as you say, when you can't walk into a classroom or, you know, the equivalent of that. So how do you, so we're interested to see, you know, at the, at the PTC, of course, we're constantly re-looking at the things that we teach 
as someone becomes a principal or becomes better at being a principal. Uh, so what are the things that we're learning out of this experience? Are there, you know, is there a new set of skills or is there a re-emphasis on certain skills is going to be something that will turn up in creating an effective school classes and other places to say, hey, now that we've been through this experience, here are some of the things um, that we've learned. How do we get those learning principles off the page and into this environment that we're, that we're now in? And we, we put a, quite a premium in the PTC, rightfully, on the idea that we're in this place called the International School, which in and of itself has morphed over, you know, that definition has morphed over uh, the three or so decades that we've been working on it. And now we have another context, the international school virtually. So is that going to make any difference to how we prepare ourselves and, and in fact, how we enact? We do have a question here. What were some of the key takeaways that you and your staff learned from reaching out to parents and families? And what might you and your staff do differently moving forward as a result on that specific one? Yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot of takeaways here. I, I tracked all the, the emails that came in for teachers and or for principals and myself and just looked at the, the, the threads, the common themes. Um, one uh, common theme was the, the regular communication. Honest, transparent, open communication was something that was critical for our parents. Um, two, the home life situation. The reason why parents have their kids in school. Um, yes, it is about learning, but there's also a need for, for child care, if I'm going to be honest about it. Uh, at some of the younger ages where both parents are working. And so as an institution, uh, the feedback we receive from a lot of parents is, how can you better support us going into the future? After school care, early morning drop-off. Um, uh, really, uh, it's, it's uh, almost a shift I'm seeing right now that we need to do more to support our families at home. But uh, having said that, though, uh, I think there's more opportunities for engagement also. And that was feedback we received from our parents in a positive way that they really enjoyed connecting with the kids and teachers because of the online environment and, um, and participating in the learning process. So I think those were some of the key points that, that we learned through this. Okay, there's so much here. We, have, we do have a, a question about, did your school open for four and five-year-olds? We are right at the end of our time here, but did they and any additional precautions you were having for social, socially distanced learning? Let's take the four and five-year-olds. Did you reopen for four and five-year-olds? Yeah, we did. Um, and at that age, we just accepted the fact that uh, you're not going to have social distancing at that time. But we did keep groups uh, tight um, and locked in together. So during break time, eating time, class time, it was always the same group. So we could do some contact tracing if we needed to. But just good habits of uh, washing hands and, and yeah. it's just